David Lukacs, welcome to Built to Sell Radio. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So tell us where you are right now for people who, uh, who maybe got a surprise to see you uh, working in what looks like an office. I am not in my office. I am actually in Miami, Florida, actually to be more specific in Aventura, North Miami, Florida, in my kids' private school, um, contributing, you know, I'm a part of an organization called EO, Entrepreneurs Organization, and yep. one of our core values is making a mark. And so instead of sitting here and complaining and, and, and bitching, quite frankly, to, to the administration, the staff of what's going on and virtual learning, whatever, I sillily in a, in a bout of, of altruism, wrote an email to the head of school. Uh, and that meant that I just volunteered myself uh, to doing a lot of, um, I would argue, the most intellectually channel, challenging planning um, and scenario planning and practical planning that I've ever had to experience in my, in my entire life. And this is around getting the school back open. For those of you who are listening, this, I'm interviewing David in early June when Miami is certainly still very much in the throes of this COVID situation. And so you're working on how to, how to deal with uh, getting kids back to learning. And that's what I do in retirement, I guess, right? <laughs> this is what you get for selling your I don't company. Have hobbies. Yeah, this is what I get. I don't have hobbies. So, so, so talk, about, you know. talk about Dreamwater. I, I think people will be fascinated by this story. So first of all, what is Dreamwater? And how did you cook up this idea for this business? Sure. So the little blurb about Dreamwater is it's, at least in its original form, is a two and a half ounce shot that helps you relax and fall asleep. 74 ml for those listening outside of the U.S., um, so it's a little shot, just like five-hour energy, but the exact opposite. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's natural. It's a combination of GABA, melatonin, and 5-HTP. And it's just a lightly flavored water that you take before wanting to go to bed. Uh, or whenever that moment is. You could take it on the airplane. You could take it when you show up in a hotel, you know, whatever the case may be. Such a cool um, idea. Is it addictive at all? Because some people have take pills, and if they take them too much, they get sort of, they get dependent on them. I wish. I mean, we could do this whole podcast just about, you know, my own issues with sleep aids, the pharmaceutical grade sleep aids and how scary and how dangerous they are. Um, on a commercial level, had it been addictive, I would have made a lot more money. Um, I'm saying that partly in jest, but it's, it's true. The, the idea is not that it's addictive. Um, my perspective always with the sleep aid is that it's an aid and ideally um, you don't have to take it for forever. Um, the idea is to help you and there's over 70 diagnosed sleep disorders. What that sleep issue is varies by human um, and so you're not trying to do a one size fits all. It's just an, a natural liquid. So you're not taking a pill. It's not anything like that. It's just a natural liquid, lightly flavored water that helps you relax and fall asleep. And, um, and we were cognizant of all of the potential risks because sleep aids are scary to your point, right? Sure. Yeah. Side effects, it creates dependencies. Uh, you can never wean yourself off, you know, and if you want to hide it from even your spouse, you can because there's no, it's not like cigarettes that you smell it on somebody and you know that they're doing it or alcohol that you smell it on them. You don't know about sleep aids, right? How did you come up with the, did you come up with the formula? Like what was the genesis of the business? Like yeah, how did I, you actually come up with I it? I partnered with my co-founder, Vincent, to, to, he had created the baseline, you know, the, what I call Dreamwater 1.0. That's not what we commercialized. So basically he came, when I found him, it was with like a working prototype, let's call it, right? With a good name called Dreamwater. And uh, we, partnered, we partnered in the summer of 2009. Um, and then we launched with Dwayne Reed in New York City um, in mid-December 2009. So really our first- For those of you who are not in, in, in the US, Dwayne Reed is not a person. It's a, it's, it's a pharmacy or a, you know, a, a shop. If you've ever been to New stuff. York, they're, they're, they're your pharmacy, they're your convenience store, they're, Walmart, they're your everything yeah. store in every corner, uh, especially in Manhattan, but it's in the greater- you know, New York area. It's now owned by Walgreens, but at the time it was independent. Um, and we launched in New York for a variety of reasons um, with the idea of putting the city that never sleeps to sleep. I love that. And yes, yes. So we is that why you chose to, is that why you chose to launch in New York? Um, no, in New York. For, so first of all, I ended up roping in two other people, my younger brother being one of them. I roped them in. So we were like a little pot of four and three out of the four of us were either born there or have lived in New York multiple times. When we were thinking about how do you launch a product in such a big geography with so many variables like the United States, we said we could go the ancillary market route and I call Miami ancillary. Um, and because it's in my home and all those things, although I was living in New York when I started Dreamwater uh, living, I was there more than in Miami. And, um, 
And we said, instead of messing around with an ancillary market, let's go straight to New York where we'll see, because this wasn't like, I think I have the best idea ever. Um, and I'm just going to go do it at all costs. Since a water of normal liquid that helps you relax and fall asleep has never existed before at this point, while we thought it was a good idea, while I thought it was a good idea, um, the entirety of it, including raising money at the beginning, was it was very much a thesis. Like, I need to put it out there in the market and have the market tell me if there is a need for this or not. So the entire thing, I would argue all the way through, I was constantly trying to learn, um, to learn to iterate, to learn to develop, and, and across a variety of things. But all of it from, especially the beginning, was I didn't even know if there was going to be demand for something like this. I just assumed there would be. Um, and what was the startup like? I mean, are you, are you raising a ton of money and, and doing industrial grade manufacturing or are you like, <laughs> you invented like putting a pot together in your basement? Like what was like, how did you guys, the, the, the first sort of iteration? That is how this, the latter is how Vincent created that initial prototype. I'm kidding, but to some degree, but, um, the, the, at the outset, at the outset, this was, no, we worked with major, you know, labs and things. And um, I think as a backdrop, I should say that we, me, I personally always said, we're in the business of selling dream water, not making it, but I have to worry about making it too. <laughs> so it wasn't that I had to go build my whole, you know, factory and lines. You use these um, other companies where you can outsource your production that are generally called or referred to as co-packers. So you send over all your ingredients, all of your components, or they can buy it for you. It depends on your relationship with the co-packer. Uh, you send it all over to the co-packer and the co-packer puts it together for you and sends you back a finished product. Um, and so, and so I say it in that tone because I was always very clear that for me it was about selling it. If I ever got big enough where it would warrant me having my own facilities, I never even came close to that because I don't, I'm not, I was very clear on the fact that I was not in the business of making it. I had to worry about making it, but I was in the business of selling it. And those are two totally different functions. How'd you get into Dwayne Reed? Because I'd imagine a huge retailer like that is a labyrinth of decision makers. Well, our biggest challenge was again, thinking about the size and scope of the United States as a market and how do you start or launch our basic thought process and proposition was fish where the fish are. And that was always our thought. It's not about the long term. On the long term, I want my business to look like this. But I thought was thinking about how, what do I have to do today to win to get to tomorrow? And then from there, how do I get to the next day? And so on and so forth. And in that regard, we looked at it and we said, in, in this idea of fishing where the fish are, we said, well, if I ask you for a bottle of water, if you're a consumer here in the US or in general, wherever you're listening from or watching from, um, you'll say, okay, I'll go to my local convenience store, my local 7-Eleven or whatever for a bottle of water. But if I ask you for a headache medicine or something for my stomach pain or what have you, you'll default into at least more probably than not drug, you know, a drugstore or what have you. So I thought, okay, sleep aids. Nobody's ever really been trained to go buy sleep aids in 7-Eleven. They're trained to go buy it in drugstores. And when we settled on New York, you know, as our location, that's what it told us Dwayne Reed. We didn't say Dwayne Reed. We said, we looked at it holistically. We said, where? New York. Mind you, in 2009, 2010, the direct-to-consumer piece of e-commerce doesn't look like what it looks like today. So that wasn't really an option. It wasn't even a part of our consideration. It was always about food, drug, mass channels, we were in an airport in a big way in, in specialty, specialty retail, uh, air travel eventually and all that stuff or whatever. So what I'm, what I'm saying is, right, so you, how do you dissect it? And it was, those, it was those things that told us where to go. And then we are relentlessly resourceful, every one of us. And so once we knew it was Dwayne Reed, now it was who do we know in Dwayne Reed? One of us happened to Christmas with the beverage buyer, not every year, but has done Christmas with the beverage buyer. We're like, great. And that was right. But the point is, is that w once we holistically decided what our launch area geography and channel was, distribution channel, i.e. drugstores, um, that told us Dwayne Reed. And then it's just about being incredibly resourceful to get into Dwayne Reed. How does it work? And this is my ignorance playing out. I would have thought a big regional, you know, retailer like Dwayne Reed would have bought nationally, they would have said, we're only stocking it if we can stock it in all of our stores. There's none of this onesie twosie in Manhattan, but not in Arizona. Is that the way it works? Or, or can you pick a store or pick a region and get it into one location? Not every retailer is the same. So again, and just to be clear, when, when, we, um, when we did our deal and launched with Dwayne Reed, they were independent. About three months into launching with Dwayne, Dwayne Reed, Walgreens bought them. 
they didn't close the transaction, but they bought them. And so we were chain wide with Dwayne Reed in their entirety of their chain. Um, and then we, we had to filter our way into Walgreens on a national basis, but because it was that, if not, it would have been a standalone and we would have been chain wide with Dwayne Reed and then chain wide with Walgreens and so on and so forth. With some of these big box retailers, you are able to, within reason and to some degree, do things on a regional geographic basis because you have thousands of Walmarts and thousands and, of, of And did you give them exclusivity for a period of time when you launched? No, I never gave anybody exclusivity. Um, I should also say I've pissed off every retailer in this country at least once. Um, <laughs> How'd you do that? Because, because the, again, with, cause if not, we can, we can make this about that instead of selling your business, but no, I want to get to selling. <laughs> well, no, but, 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 but quite frankly, it's because the dirty little secret and that everybody gets excited is that they got into Walgreens. They got into Walmart. It's not about getting in. It's about how you're in that store. So when you're relegated to the bottom of a shelf with one facing the chances of that being a tangible business for you that you can invest behind and build on or whatever is slim to none. Um, and, and, and that's what I mean just as a touch point or as an example of, it's not about getting in. If you got in and you're relegated to the bottom of the sleep aid set or what have you, your, your business, while it might be viable, there is never going to scale to be a certain number. Whereas, so how did you get your, uh, how did you get your product front and center? Because oddly, um, I believe the delivery format and I was piggybacking, I was using five hour energy as my roadmap um, and saying that, yes, there's more usage occasions and more of a need and more consumption happening around the sleep shot, uh, the energy shot as a format. But I am also a premium, they're a premium energy shot, functional shot of energy. I'm a premium functional shot of sleep. And between the two of us, and it was a lot about going to the retailer and talking to them about their impulsive areas of the store, which are higher volume, higher sell through areas of the store, I was always looking at it and saying, but they've blazed the path for me. They, you have a little box of five hour energy at the front of a 7-Eleven or at the front of a Walgreens or at the front of a, of a, of a supermarket or you, know, you name it. And so I said, now instead of having seven flavors, five flavors, three flavors of five hour energy, give me one of those spots or how do you include me? Keep their seven, but include one or two of mine. So it was really about that. It was, it was, it was about that. And then when we went in, to those types of opportunities, which sometimes we did through corporate, sometimes we did on a regional basis. Um, again, be resourceful, be relentlessly resourceful, I would say. Um, we would sometimes do these things on a regional basis. So while I was going to Chicago to sell corporate Walgreens, their program, I was also on a regional basis building the relationships so I can execute the programs and build data with them in their formats in a program that they would do and execute at, at the corporate level. In other words, I wasn't trying to do something that they would never execute across, you know, 8,000 plus stores. What was it for them? Cause five hour energy, they've got a pre-existing relationship. They know how much sells through, they kind of know the product. What was in it for Walgreens to add another skew by in, in adding dream water? First of all, you get from a functional perspective between energy and sleep, you're covering Let's say energy covers 18 hours Middle of the, the day. Middle the grave, baby. <laughs> or 16 hours of the day. The, the next eight gets covered by dream water. Um, and sleep is fundamentally sleep. Proper sleep is the most important thing. If you go to the doctor, they're going to say lose weight, right? It, it almost seems like whenever you go to the doctor, the solution to everything, your knee pain, your back pain, or your heart issues are all about losing weight. But if you don't sleep right, you stress eat, you, you, you live a life with more stress if you're not getting that recharge. Uh, that sleep brings you. So from a health and wellness perspective, again, fish where the fish are, the drugstore chains really understood the importance and the value of sleep. Mm. And on the basis of that, you're able to say, fine. And how do we, the wording would be, how can we be incremental to your baseline? Their baseline isn't zero of sales. And that varies based on where you are in the store. But how can we, our proposition of Dreamwater, be incremental to your business? That's how you have to talk to the retailers. It's not you will sell, you won't sell. Everything that goes into their stores will sell. It's, will it sell above a baseline and is it incremental? So if you have a bunch of different ways to do shampoos, but they're all shampoos, at one point it doesn't become incremental anymore. You're trading between this customer and this customer. The novelty of dream water, a water that helps you relax and fall asleep, a lightly flavored natural water that helps you relax and fall asleep, has not, it's not that you're trading. It's not that you're going between Advil and Tylenol or Coke and Pepsi, you're not trading you're literally creating an entire new consumer product category and segment. 
and that was front and center. You didn't have to be so overt about it with the retailers. We were resourceful in putting the product in front of the retailer or the key decision makers, explaining to them our thoughts and our ideas. But I always said that we open the doors and the product does the selling because it, for the most part really worked. It was really beneficial and it really worked. And, and you, it was and you can see what people, nature and everything. And you can see where people would buy both at the same time, right? Like I'm going to grab a five energy to get through the day, but man, that's going to make me edgy. So I'll use this on the back end. Down. Like you could see people buying it um, in uh, as a bundle. <laughs> How did you finance I this? To, I wanted to that to do that so badly. It was just so hard to collaborate with Five Hour, and or to get the retailers to to really you know let us do something very smart and holistic. Um, yeah, you know. So why, why was it so hard to uh, to bundle or, or work with Five Hour Energy? Because we were so small relative to them, and you know, why did Kodak lose the? You know, they they developed the digital camera. Sorry to use such a weird cliche because you don't mm. know things until you know them. You sit there and you're comfortable. You sit there and you're comfortable until you're not, until you're disrupted. And, um, and um, I mean, I would have some conversations with them, whatever, but they, they had no incentive, I guess. It, it didn't occur yeah. to them. It didn't matter to them to increase. They, they had a very nice, they have a very nice, very profitable, very cash flow generating business. Um, they didn't necessarily care. They didn't have the, the, the gun to the head to go. I don't, foresee them going the way of Kodak, obviously. Uh, they're very entrenched into a lot of people's lives and routines. And that format works because of what they've trailblazed into that delivery format. Um, sure. but, but, uh, but they just didn't see it that way. They didn't need to. How did you finance? It sounds like you had partners. Maybe talk a little bit about the financing of the business. I never had a war chest of cash. And you asked that at the beginning. I wanted to touch on that. Thanks for bringing it back. Um, the first 100 grand or so was out of my pocket. Uh, it was all an experiment. We raised the first million and my dad participated in every round that we did so um you know that was that was important um but we we raised the first million sort of in october and we launched october november of 2009 and we launched with Dwayne reed in in, in mid-december you know 2009 so just to give you a sense of how close we were to launch point mm. why a million dollars because it was a nice round number to test to see do we have something or not remember the entire thing was sort of a thesis like let's do it and put it out there and see what we have. And, um, and, uh, in all we raised about 6 million bucks. Um, it was with no bells and whistles. It was all one class of LLC units. There was no, I never had any debt, uh, certainly no traditional debt into the cap structure. And uh, I never had any sort of restrictions or gun to my head relative to either the equity raising side or the, obviously there was no debt. So nothing can sort of compel me to do stuff. Although I do believe very much in corporate governance and transparency and all that. Um, the one I would, the one thing I would say though, is I say that number and I never had a war chest of cash. I never had, I think I touched $2 million in the bank account once for a brief moment. And in the realm of what we were trying to do and in the CPG space, that is almost no money. It is very expensive. Uh, to work with all these retailers. It is very expensive to do these big, broad marketing mm -hmm. campaigns without attributing it to sales. These brand building, I'm going to call it brand building, not marketing. Because in today's digital world, you have no incentive to go out and run a $100,000 or a million dollar TV spend just to see if it moved the needle. But in 2008, 2009, 2010, 11, in those early year years, we did everything. We, we lost millions of dollars in marketing, let's call it, right? Um, because we had to go out and do a hundred thousand dollars spend to see if it moves the needle, be it with billboards, with magazines, with PR, with you name it. And, and you need to be able to have, to play that game, the branding game, doing things because it'll elevate and build your brand, not correlating it to sales. Um, you can lose a lot of money very, very quickly. And for that, you really do need a war chest of cash. How did you guys value the company, uh, for the first round? You mentioned, you raised a million. What was the implied valuation? I don't remember. It was probably like 5 million post money. Uh, but I can tell you this, I can tell you this. And I think it's a mistake that I see and hear entrepreneurs making all the time. Um, who do we raise? And this is myself included who we raise from at least in those initial rounds is from friends and family, legitimate friends and family. Typically, I'm not saying this as a full-blown statement. 
And what happens is we have all these inflated valuation metrics uh, relative to these people that are closest to you. These are the people mm. that you spend your personal time with. You go to their houses for meals and all of that. And the way I was looking at it was I never wanted to come off as greedy, as, um, as that I overstepped or that I did too much or I asked for a $10 million valuation because I had the best idea in the world. Mm-hmm. In mind, to give them a 5X return, forget your IRR at 10 million or the higher the valuation, the bigger the return potential has to be so that they can get their returns, including on an IRR basis, not, an, not on a total return. So you could say, yeah, I 5X'd it, but if you 5X'd it over nine years, it's different than 5Xing it over one year from an IRR perspective. And so I was always attuned to that. And I, I, anybody who gives me money and bets on me and my idea and my team, um, I always took with the utmost seriousness. Um, and I, you know, so I cringe when I hear other people's money. You're going out and raising. I took that more personally than my own because my own with me, I took a chance and I gambled and it is what it is. But, and especially in that first raise and in that first round, I just, I, I'm always amazed that, that entrepreneurs put such a high valuation. What they don't realize is that they are, they are putting a gun to their own head because now your, your ability to mess up, your ability to iterate, your ability to do all those things is minimized. Um, and, you know, so, so I always find that to be interesting. What is IRR? Can you explain that? Internal rate of return. So when you, if, if I make for simple math, if I make 100% return over a two-year time period, I made 50% a year. I'm totally simplifying that because that's not actually, you know, 100% true, but your IRR is 50%. It's your, your, your annualized rate of return, right? <laughs> I, I is internal, but it's your annualized rate of return. So just because I doubled your money, there's a difference if I doubled your money in a day, a week, a year, or 10 years. The faster I do it, the better the, the actual return was. And so, and so when you raised that first million dollars, were you talking uh, to investors about a potential IRR? No, because there's no way. And my, my you know, when I get pitched, you know, investments and things and whatever. I mean, when I hear somebody sort of really talk about their exit plans, I'm not saying that there doesn't have to be, I get very nervous because life doesn't work how you want it to work. And it doesn't work. I don't think ever one of my budgets was right. I don't think, you know, I, I used to do things because it's the right way to do it. Like plan out five years, show them five years financials. I said, I'm not even right five months out. How the hell am I going to be right? You know, five years out. So then I started doing three year planning. And then I was like, I'm going to show you the next year, year and a half, two years, because I'm wrong. I already know I'm wrong. And, and it, I wasn't so focused on, on, on the output. That's certainly not a way I raise money. Um, even after I had commitments from people to raise money in my philosophy, my real filter that I would verbally communicate with people is what is, if this is something that you lose, I want you to still be able to invite me over to your house for dinner even with new friends and family, so to speak, even along the way, I had the same filter and I would literally work that into, it's like I had the sale done, so to speak. And I would still make sure that you understood how important it was for me that you still invite me over to your house for dinner. So if a hundred thousand dollars is not a lot of money for you, cool. If it's a lot of money for you, please don't invest a hundred grand, please invest less or don't invest at all. And I would have that conversation. It was weird. I think to some degree that actually got me people more committed to the investment, Hmm. but it it was me just being me and it was, it was me being authentically me. And so how did you pitch them on, and I'm, I'm driving at, and there, there are a lot of people listening to this saying, I'd love to raise money for my company. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to do that. And all I'm hearing David say is, is how to convince people not to invest or, you know, cover yourself. And so you're not getting people to, you know, overextend themselves but what was the pitch like how how did you convince them to invest a million dollars did you say one day we're going to be worth 10 or like what was the pitch that you used first of all i don't think i called it a pitch i, I or what was the no no no, case no but w- yeah. words matter and i didn't go into it thinking that it was a pitch it was always a conversation and i always did it in the context of I think I have a really good idea. The same philosophy that worked with retailers worked with investors too. I was resourceful. 
I was connected. And if it wasn't me, I was connected to somebody who was connected to X amount of people. Right. And, and, um, and it was the same thing. I have to open the door. Right. And they are investing in me. They have to be credible. But the most important thing, and this is relative to my product. If you have your app, your tech platform, you, you make this mean whatever it means to you. But for me, I, I was at the beginning right away. I already knew that what I needed to do was put it in your hands and get you to try it. Once I got you to try it and experience it, it would, it was logical that there was other people that, that needed the benefits of a mainstream liquid sleep aid. Sure. Um, if it wasn't just you, like let's say you had no sleep issues or whatever. And I would actually encourage, and I would send you as much as I could. So if, if you said, I don't have a sleep issue, I would say to you, great, who does? And let me give you, just hand it out, hand it out to your employees, hand it out to your coworkers, hand it out to your, your, your spouse, your sister, your brother, whoever, because that's the validation. And I wasn't pitching on necessarily, obviously, look, look guys, there should be a big need for this. We should have a nice exit one day or whatever, but we have to work this thing. We're not just building a brand. We're building an entire category and hoping to define that category with our brand, right? And when I position it like that, the biggest thing that I could do was get you to, get you to be a believer in Dreamwater and me. But I think it was in that order. 1A, Dreamwater, the product. 1B was me. And it was so new, so novel, so unique. Um, that, and it was fairly self-evident that if this thing really does work and it really does help, that there's going to be a need for it, that I didn't have to trot out a 50 page, let me tell you about the industry. I hate that too, by the way. If you're doing business plans, whatever, just scrap all of that. I, nobody looks at it. Nobody ever, ever, ever looks at your whole market dynamic. And I love, my most absolute favorite is, it's a $1 billion market, but if I can only get 1% of that, that equals X. <laughs> like guys, come on, stop it. If you're listening to this, I'm telling you, your industry section should go away substantially. And you're to some degree, and obviously it doesn't, it's not like that in every sector or segment, but if you get something out of this is keep it simple, stupid, like keep it real tight, understand what you're pitching, so to speak, understand what you're trying to accomplish and just get to that. So David, what I'm hearing you say is the, the first million was uh, based on sort of a back of the envelope valuation. And it was really more about, do you believe in the product, the efficacy of the product, et cetera? How did that evolve that that story evolve as you went for more and more money because ultimately you raised six million so did did the did the conversation sort of uh, evolve in any way did it become more kind of based on metrics or there's some underlying valuation technique that was being used as you raised more and more money or was it always just always the sort of more pitch about the story of what the product could be no obviously and I, there was always real decks with real data with all of that the always always um i just didn't trot out the fluff i wanted to just hear here's what it what what we're really doing and making sure that they understood that we're sitting here trying to learn so in that first million dollar tranche let's say it was part of my pitch was this is a gamble i don't know if there's sure. demand in it or not and to some degree it is easier to raise money with white space with no data because you can you can manipulate or put forth data that you think is going to happen and explain why it's reasonable and, and what have you. You can do that. When you start to have some data, you don't have the ability to just white space it. You don't have the ability to just say, I'm worth this because I think I'm going to be able to sell a tremendous amount. Some amount of data is going to come into play and then that's going to dictate what your business looks like. And fortunately, fortunately for us, we had sort of a, a, a pretty good trajectory at the beginning. It was, it was a series of wins. I never had a bad meeting. I, I, I used to always say, I never had a bad meeting ever. Hmm. Um, again, I think it speaks to the product. That's why I knew I was onto something and never had a bad meeting. It was unique, novel, really incremental for the, these, I never had a bad meeting. Um, but also keep in mind, we launched in New York, people with money, certainly a lot of money, the financial people, the, all this stuff, they're living in New York, a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And if not, you're a tourist or you go for your business meeting. I'm living in Kansas city or Miami or wherever I tend to go to New York and as we started to scale up the investment rounds, right? I might not be in your local supermarket and I might not have been in your local airport or what have you, but I was really well done in Manhattan, not in the boroughs, but I was really tight in Manhattan. So you'd kind of walk in and out of any store because we blitzed Manhattan, we were very tight. That I think had a big effect so that when we came in to pitch Dreamwater, while somebody in San Francisco might not have ever heard it or in Montana, the people in New York did. And 
for whatever reason, most of what we raised was in New York. Most, most and of what our was the, investor base. What was the valuation metric you were using in those more formal rounds? Was it a multiple of forward-looking sales or historical profit? Like what, what was the kind of key determinant of the value? Well, remember the ramp is slow because even if, you know, retailers have their, their planogram windows. So you have to, you have to get to them. If they review their entire category in March and you get to them in April, you can't even go to them until the next March. And then they'll say yes. And you're in and their reset will happen three to four months after the, that review period. So until the summer. So like, just keep in mind, you can't just ramp up because you know, for whatever, and, or if they didn't say yes to you in that moment and they reset, you still have to you come back the next year. Right. Um, so it wasn't exactly like that. Um, the truth, if I recall correctly, it was how much dilution was I willing to take where I was also factoring in that my dad was always investing in these rounds. So what did it take for him to, to allow other people in or what did it take for some of my investors? And I was always looking at it from a cap structure perspective and how much dilution can I really handle? It wasn't, it wasn't the, the three times, five times revenue or, any of those metrics. I never did it. I didn't sell the company that way either, by the way. It was what sort of made sense relative to my existing cap structure um, and that I can handle and stomach. Um, you know, and and where did you land on that question? Where did you land on that question of dilution? What, what were you comfortable with? I mean, I, I can fast forward. Me and my family, because it wasn't just me. Uh, we have a family office in my family. And so um, the, the Lekach block, if you will, finished somewhere around owning 55% of the company, something like that. Um, again, my dad did invest in all these rounds. It was less in each rounds, but he was investing in all the rounds. Um, I never did a series A, B, C. It was just like, okay, I, I'm looking ahead at what, what is coming in the pipeline because you have some visibility. Again, long lead times in terms of selling into real world retailers. You know it's coming. And I was able to, um, you know, to sort of project and sort of look at what do I need there. Um, you know, with all the focus in terms of fundraising, I will say that, um, and, you know, in my EO world or otherwise, you know, we always hear about um, the scrappiness of it. And I want to acknowledge, I think I would be remiss if I don't acknowledge that as much as it is painful that I didn't have that war chest of cash to go out and spend and brand build and do all the fluffy stuff so that everybody would know what Dreamwater was. Um, I equally know that it made me be infinitely better as an operator. Um, not having that war chest of cash, not having that margin of error, because if I had more money, I would have had nicer offices. I would have, you know, I would have flown better. I mean, sure. you have to see, you know, I, mean, I, you know, price mattered on everything that wasn't consumer facing, uh, even consumer facing, but certainly, so we didn't stay in the nicest hotels and we didn't, you know, even though we were road warriors, all of us, you know, and so on and so forth. So it, it, it really forced us to stay lean and mean and, 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 and that really proved to be beneficial. And certainly we're sitting here in a time of COVID uh, that, you know, you might be nice and fat and looking at your bank account, but if you're, if you're, if you're negative cash flowing, um, that money will go away. And, yeah. um, and then if, if COVID happens, you know, or whatever happens, right. You know, Walmart kicks you out or who knows what's going to happen. You can't weather that storm if you weren't really prudent with your, with your, and really responsible on the fiscal side of the equation. So how big did you get this company before you decided to sell it big in terms of revenue or whatever proxy you want to use for size? So we got on the hockey stick growth curve in, two, in the start of 2013. We felt it. We knew it was there. I mean, it was really awesome. We were, we were growing all the time, but we got on that hockey stick growth curve. But I did have my highest highs and lowest lows with Walmart in about a three, more, three to four month span in 2013 that almost ended the company. So there was a retrenchment there. I never broke 10 million in terms of sales. It was just sub 10, you know, somewhere around there, but I did live off my cash flow for the last five years that I was operating it. I sold in year nine in ninth year of operating. So the last five years or so I did streamline the entire business to live off of my cash flow. Forget war chest. I didn't have any margin of error right there. Right. My zero line was really zero. I mean, you'd stopped raising money and you were just living off because of I knew. The proceeds and, of the business. Yeah. And there was just too much complication because, because I, again, I got on the hockey stick growth curve. That if I kept going, I would have either A, been able to live off my cash flow at an elevated dollar amount, or I would have been able to raise more money at that moment. And again, that started and stopped and there's reasons for it, but I think that that's not the point of the conversation. But, you know, 
Walmart was 30% of my business. And then, you know, an interruption with them as a, as a key customer, as a key client had a very uh, detrimental effect in the business. But then in the years that followed in 2014, but really more so finishing 2014, 2015, I started to find my, my groove again. I went from being shell shocked and just surviving, just living to getting back into innovation, getting back into product development, um, getting creative from a marketing perspective again. All the things that I always liked about business, that's how I got myself back. So I've really had, when I, my dream water journey is not this sort of straight line, look at me. I wouldn't even say I'm a nine year overnight success. Um, I would say that I've literally lived and experienced everything that you can, I think, in a corporate journey. Um, and I was lucky enough, because I think luck has a huge factor of it. I was lucky enough to have a, a nice enough outcome at the end, financially speaking. Or what happened with Walmart? Walmart? Um, we were doing all these regional things. We were selling to corporate. So I'd go to Bentonville, Arkansas, and Northwest Arkansas, and, and do my pitches to corporate. But I was building this data with regional operators inside of Walmart and doing these display programs and what have you in our velocities were off the charts so much so that the front end department of Walmart believed the data that we were generating in their stores and said, we believe that you're very impulsive because sleep aids are not impulsive. Dream water was impulsive, but sleep from a consuming perspective, but dream water, but, but uh, sleep aids are not. So they had never thought to put dream like a sleep aid into an impulsive area of the store. It could be on a display. It could be by the registers. And it was a different department inside of Walmart that we had to go pitch. It doesn't matter that you're in Walmart. We had to go pitch a different department. And I, um, and with that department, they put us on their front ends, but they buried us. So it's the only time I, I, I didn't get to see what the program would be for me to say no to. Had I seen it, I would have said no to going to the front ends of Walmart because it was, I've never seen somebody sort of bend to the bottom shelf on a register area to impulsively buy something that they've never heard of before called a sleep aid called dream water. And it was buried instead of putting me par like on the, on par with in, in an invisible way, Five Hour had like six, seven, eight boxes sitting up on the front of stands. We were in the bottom of that, not even adjacent to one box, you know, like where, where that. So their execution of it sort of rendered us down to the bottom. And so when I saw that for the first time, I knew we were fucked. I knew it. Again, goes back to the original, one of the first things that we talked about here. It's not about getting into these stores. It's about how you're in these stores, which is also why I've said no to every retailer at least once in this country. So um, that was the only time where I didn't know what, it, what the program was going to look like. And then at that point, because I'm nonstop a mile a minute or whatever, my own brokers and sales reps, whatever, were like, you're never happy. You're never satisfied. Everybody in this industry would kill to be on their front ends. doesn't matter where you're on the front ends. I said, that's the difference between me and everybody else. I know I'm fucked. That was my response then. And they just looked at it like, this kid is never satisfied. This kid is never happy. You know, he doesn't understand what it means to be at the front end of the the Mecca of retailing in the entire world, not just in the United States. Um, and to be fair, I didn't know the gravity or understand the gravity of that positively. I didn't understand it, which is part of why to some degree I was fearless in my, in my, in my relentlessness. I was fearless in it because I, I didn't understand or appreciate the gravity of selling to Walmart. Selling to Walmart was at the beginning of it was just another day for me. And, um, you know, and so, and so I, that's why I was able to be sort of relentless, like go in and do all these things and, and, and so on and so forth. So that's what happened. And I knew that that was going to equal a lot of pain and problems for us. And in the front ends, they reset at least every six months. So I knew, uh, I knew within three, four months, I was already out of the next reset. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then that started a retrenchment in that entire account because because I was running all these regional programs to get to this point where I can standardize it through corporate. And, and so therefore I didn't have the regional programs to fall back on. I was still in their sleep set in the pharmacy area, but I wasn't doing the impulsive stuff that was driving a tremendous amount of volume. And I lost the front end of Walmart. So that was what happened there. When you said that when you saw their proposal, the stock at below, you know, eye level and so forth, you would have, had you gone and seen, you would have never agreed to it how how would you have had any leverage? It's the world's largest retailer. Don't they get to decide where they're going to put your product? Like when you say, I would never have agreed to it, what are you agreeing to? Aren't they just writing a check to put your product on the shelf? Because I wouldn't say it so bluntly, right? But I would explain to them why I'm going to pass on that opportunity. 
I'm not going to change them. That's, that's a bad assumption that you're ever going to do. That's why you're laughing when you're asking that question. How do you dictate? You don't need to be Walmart, CVS, Walgreens. Heck, your regional supermarket chain is huge, right? Um, and, so, and so who am I to dictate to them? They know what they're doing. I understand that implicitly. But I have the choice whether to sell them or not. And do I care about announcing that I'm doing that program? Do I care about the dollars and cents that come from that? Or do I care about the longevity of what I'm trying to do? And when I say that, I would say no to that. It's because until I get a program that I am sufficiently comfortable with, I'm using them as an example, but until I do, I don't want to say yes. I might be wrong in my comfort level of why I'm comfortable, whatever, but at least on paper and in my mind, it had to have some potential output that on a long-term basis is going to work. I don't want to sell into this review period and then be out in the next one. I never wanted to do that because then good luck getting back in. Um, and then yeah, you don't have a business. Sense. Yeah, it makes sense. So what was the trigger that made you want to sell Dreamwater? It sounds like you recovered from the Walmart, uh, that, that piece. What made you want to sell? Um, it wasn't that I wanted to sell. I, I implicitly, and, and, and sort of even on a subconscious level, I wasn't thinking about it every day, I always wanted to position Dreamwater. Dreamwater and my daughter are the same age. They're both my babies. Mm. My daughter's my firstborn. And, and I always thought about selling, not in terms of how do I recoup every last dollar and cent for me and my, my shareholders. I always thought about selling or the potential of an aqu acquisition where I needed to leave enough for the acquirer to make money too. So let's start there. That was sort of always my belief. Um, and the deal needed to be something where I felt that Dreamwater was going to be in the right hands or be given the right opportunity. So my perfect acquirer that I, I swear, I, I, I always, and I tried, I spoke to their president and I, at different points and different members of their team and whatever. My perfect acquirer would have been Five Hour Energy because what Five Hour Energy could have done relative to literally anybody else, including Coke and everybody else, Five Hour Energy could have just said, hey, 7-Eleven or Walmart, instead of putting seven, eight, nine, ten of my boxes here, they could have said, I control that real estate, so I want to put a dream water in there. They were my perfect, but not because they would offer me the most dollars. In my mind, they were the most perfect because they can accelerate me from 10 to $50 million overnight because I'm going for the exact same segments. We're both premium functional shots, and I'm going after the exact same segments and so on and so forth. So absent five-hour energy, it was about trying to understand who is a potential acquirer for me that would make the most amount of sense. But before, before we get to the, was there must've been some of you're, you're going, you're growing. There must've been some trigger or something that happened to make you decide, okay, now I want to sell and start I have, around. So I had a Canadian distributor. Um, and in terms of the, the layout of the market, like the channels, food, drug, mass convenience, air travel, you know, a lot of other countries don't look like the United States. It's not like we have, you know, it's not like they have 7-Elevens and Walgreens is and Targets and Walmarts and, um, you know, and so on and so on and so on. A lot of times they're consolidated into one or what have you, right? And Canada always looked the most like the United States. It just does, right? By way of the way the market lays out, it's just that it's more geographically spread out and less people. And, um, and so um, we, we were doing a lot of work for our Canadian distributorship by way of, we did all the manufacturing, we were doing all the sales pitching, we were doing all that, including that I would, me or one of my team would be at every retailer sales pitch with our distributor in Canada or whatever. That was just always how we worked. And um, oddly, the Canadian market wasn't doing great for us. Mm. Um, and I was looking at that and saying, I'm doing, I was managing their, the Amazon Canada account directly. I was like, it's easier for me to just do it instead of explaining to you what to do. Um, and things like that. And I'm just giving some examples. And so, um, and so I was that summer, this was in the summer of two, in the second half of the summer of 2017, I was looking at, in my mind, I had never communicated, had a great relationship. We were weekly huddles and, you know, all this stuff, but I was saying, I'm doing most of the work. Why do I need them? That was in my thought process. And as I'm thinking that I get an unsolicited term sheet from the head of the distributorship that he wants to buy me. An unsolicited term sheet from the head of the distributor. Who's the distributor? 
it was the guy created an entity. He's done different things in the consumer product space, but he created an entity called Dreamwater Canada. Okay. So, and he said, I want to buy. He had a buy sell relationship with me. So for simplicity purposes, I'm not that far off, but for simplicity purposes, Dreamwater, the shot of Dreamwater would cost me 50 cents, five zero US dollar cents. Is, um, everything I say is in US dollars, right? So um, it would cost me 50 cents and I was selling it to him at a dollar. And then he had to sell it to retailers for a dollar 50 so that they could sell it for three bucks. I'm simplifying this, right? Yeah. Yeah. He didn't have enough margin to do what he had to do to be profitable, absent huge scale, which he didn't have yet. So his idea was I need to basically get to your cost of goods. So I have a chance at making money. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm overly simplifying a lot of this for the sake of sure. time. And so that was his, I think, you know, in, in understanding that now, that was his goal. How do I bring down my cost of goods so I have a chance to make money here in Canada? The easiest thing was, let me just buy you. Um, and I knew he didn't have the money. I knew, and he was very connected on Bay Street. Um, so the funny thing about Canada is like in the US, every major retailer is seemingly somewhere else. In Canada, a lot of the major retailers are all in Toronto. So one trip to Toronto, and you could bang out three or four major retailer meetings. Right. It used to be you could go to Chicago and maybe do like Walgreens and Kmart when Kmart mattered mm. uh, or existed for that matter. And, um, and it, but that was very rare. You'd have to go to Bentonville, Arkansas for Walmart. You'd have to go to Minneapolis sure. for uh, Target. You had to go to Woonsocket, Rhode Island for CVS. You get my, my drift? I do. So, you know, and then the supermarket chains are somewhere. Yeah. All of them are somewhere else. But right? in Toronto, you can do Toronto, get all your you boys. You got La yeah. is there. You got, you got uh, a shopper's drug mart, Rexall. Yeah you know, and so on and so forth. They're all there. They're all in Toronto. And, and so the hub of the world is Toronto. And I had seen this guy, I always joked with him, you need to teach me how to raise money your way because you don't even own anything. You don't even have anything. And dude, you're raising at valuations at, at my level. And, and, and all you have is a buy sell arrangement that I can take away at any moment. I, I said to him, because I wasn't arguing it, I was really curious to learn. He still owes me a lesson, my friend, Steve. He still owes me a lesson on how he does it. But I think a lot of it has to do with that he's constantly on Bay Street. Bay Street knows, Bay Street, for those of you listening, is like the Wall Street of Canada. Uh, Wall Street is the Wall Street of the United States in, 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 in New York. It's the hub of the, it's the financial hub of a country. And, um, and so in Bay Street, you know, he was very connected. And he, I just saw him raise all this money yeah. over time. And so I knew going into this that he had to go raise money to buy me. Um, but, and then just to fast forward a little bit from that unsolicited term sheet, which I even called him and said, how do you even propose something? You don't know my numbers. He goes, no, but I'll propose it. And now we'll get into the diligence and we'll go look it in and whatever. But I was never going to allow him to fish. It takes time. It it's a distraction for me as an operator. And I didn't have a huge team or anything like that. It's a distraction for me. And I, I was very clear on that. It wasn't like I had to understand or debate it. And we negotiated. I, I got on a plane. I went to Toronto a couple of times over the course. What was your of reaction to his term sheet? I was like, what the fuck is this based on? Probably was my initial reaction. <laughs> it's bullshit and it's probably nothing. Um, How was the valuation? What was he offering? I don't even remember. Um, I don't even remember. But, but it wasn't about the valuation. I was like, what is it based on? If it's not based on anything... The minute we get into diligence, he'll start to correct it based on whatever it is that he thinks he needs to correct it on. So the point is, is that um, we, we went back and forth and we negotiated the term sheet to, and we signed an actual term sheet, like right after Thanksgiving of 2017, uh, end of November, start of December uh, of 2017. But here's what I knew going into it. And when I give a talk from a Dreamwater perspective, which this is my third webinar or podcast in the last, mm. you know, seven days, which is cool. Um, when I, when I, it's usually my dream water story. And when I get to this part of the story, I have sort of five or six key points and takeaways. And the first one is find your leverage. In other words, know who you're, know who you're working with, who you're doing that interaction with. This can apply to uh, a retailer, understand what they, what would be interesting to them and sell into that. The idea here was, understanding his leverage. What, what was his incentive to do this deal with me? And also I knew him. So we had already known each other very intimately for three, four years. We knew each other. It's not that I knew him. We knew each other at this point. So I knew things like he doesn't have the money. I knew he had to go out and raise it. I knew things like he has raised it. So I believe that he has the capability of doing so. He's not just, you know, willy nilly and all of these things. And so 
And I knew fundamentally that what he needed as a bare bone minimum response was to, um, to buy cheaper, buy closer to my cost of goods, if not at my cost of goods. So how do I do that? So going into this term sheet and understanding what I, what I call is find your leverage. Point one was around, um, um, it looked like this in execution mode. Yes, I signed the term sheet to sell, but that term sheet, I gave him two months. It, it, I didn't force it on him, but like we're sitting here at the end of November, start of December, which is a terrible time to start a deal because everybody goes away from like mid-December on. You're basically working on closing deals. And then, you know, January starts and you're working on finishing whatever you didn't do in December from a acquisition, financial perspective, investment bankers, and so on, and so on. Shitty time to start a deal, but it wasn't a force issue. I knew, um, and we put February 15th as a closing date. So it was a quick turnaround time. What I was saying to him was, and where we was aligning, I didn't force him on that date. I asked him how much time he needed. We settled in on that date. But what I was trying to do was limit the distraction for me, knowing that he had to go out and get it. It's not like he, he can just write the check. But, but hold on. I feel like I'm missing part of the story here because you got an offer, but you can't remember what it was, the specific number, but it was good enough or solid enough that you felt like you were willing to sign some sort of letter of intent. So what, like, clearly what he gave you met some sort of criteria for the value that you were looking so, for. Yeah. So again, and, and my job as a CEO is to always develop. I always looked at it as develop opportunities, have options, have choices. I would not be doing my duty, be it a legal fiduciary duty or just practically in the way I viewed my role. Sure if I didn't see this through to really understand what the hell was being offered, right? Is that the backdrop? So it wasn't even that I thought it was a great deal or that he was a good home for it because that didn't meet that criteria that I alluded to before. Um, it was me just chasing it down like I would not giving too much credence at any given moment because I need to stay dialed into what I was doing on a day-to-day -day basis. But to, to explain your point a little bit, and since I knew what he was getting at and I knew he needed to raise money, I didn't want to go through the distraction and whatever that might look like without having him have some skin in the game. So upon signing of the term sheet, when you're doing a pretty sizable transaction, the, the key point here, guys, for whoever's listening is we ended up selling to a publicly traded Canadian cannabis company for $34.5 million Canadian, Canadian dollars. Uh, it was about, at the time, at the exchange rate, it was about 27 million US. Um, so that's, that's the fast forward, right? But we were looking at this stuff, we were looking at this stuff and and I knew he had to go raise. So I said, on that size of a transaction, I think upon signing of that term sheet, 200 grand came to me. I built that into the structure. It's not about the valuation. How did I know he was offering the right amount or enough? Because the number that they offer you is only one part. It's a, it's a nice part, big part, small part, whatever you want to call it. But the structure of the whole thing matters as well. It's not just what is that number, right? And so, so and the 200 so, grand was a breakup fee or how did you structure it was that straight up? Because I said, I'm going to have to go out and hire accountants and lawyers. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be distracted. Um, I might risk my team interruptions, you know, and so on and so on and so forth. And so whatever I said, which was all real incredible equaled that. But what we did from a creative perspective was that if we couldn't get this deal done in by February 15, then we had built in equally a more detailed term sheet where I was going to license to him dream water for Canada, where effectively I was going to be front loading. He was going to raise money and pay it to me front loading my gross profit. I kind of did the calculation. I said, what is my gross profit going to be for the next three years out of Canada? Let me book it today. It wasn't a big number, but let me book it today because I was working on all sorts of other stuff here in the U S Canada was not that important to me from a dollars and cents perspective. And if they couldn't make it work or whatever, I have more important fish to fry here in the U S and I'm working on more things that I need to do here in the U S. So that was an alternative way for me to raise money with no dilution, no debt, no nothing. It was just front loading my gross profit so I can accelerate those dollars today. And I would sell to him on a go forward basis at a cost plus 10% cost plus 20%. And that's so, how you dealt with the 200 grand that he was giving you. So that for argument's sake, a hundred of the 200 of, not getting because if not we're going to get lost here in the details but some part of that 200 in that case was 100 was a fronting of money against that licensing deal got it okay that's so, helpful so that was also how i got to 200 absent that i would have probably been able to raise 100 but it was the other 100 was 
as a as a advance against the upfront payment that they'd have to pay me in the licensing deal. Got it. So so he's got some skin in the game as you guys go. Now I know he has skin in the game. Yeah. We're under a truncated time frame. I know he has skin in the game, but we've also contemplated what he really wanted conceptually. Conceptually. What he really wanted was my job and my role. Not in a bad way. But what as a fail safe at the very least to give him an opportunity and it was an alternative financing way. Innovation isn't just product development. Innovation is this, what I'm talking to you right now. And I've never heard anybody do this, but I built the whole thing in knowing that there was a very strong chance that he was never going to be able to raise this amount of money um, in this kind of time period. So with that contemplated, we already go through the process um, and I still deliver to him, remember, find your leverage, what he wanted. What he wanted was to be able to ultimately buy cheaper so that there was sure. the ability, at least on paper, that he could make money on it someday. Right? So we're, we're clear on that. Mm-hmm. So now we go forward a little bit. Um, the, you know when a deal is going to happen or not, or at least conceptually, because the deal work, the work on the deal shifts and the agreements are flying back and forth and your checklist of things that you need to do. Like you, you just know when this thing's getting heated up. And we're hitting, we hit February 15th. And the funny thing is I really would have set February 28th, but my birthday's on February 15th. And so why February 15th? He didn't push it. He never asked it. And if he hears this, this might be the first time that he will ever know that I did this. Why February 15th was because in a weird way, I would have really liked to have celebrated my 38th birthday this way. Right? <laughs> um, Got it. And so February 15th rolls around. And instead of celebrating my birthday, I, uh, with, with cheers and smiles, and I was... I, would, I never let myself dream, not the money. I never let myself dream about this as a realistic possibility. Uh, I didn't feel enough of the flow. And of course, on February 15th, you know, Steve calls me. It was the morning. I was actually driving to my EO. We have monthly meetings in EO. I was actually driving mm-hmm. to my forum meeting. When I get the call, like, hey, man, I need more time. We're not going to be able to do it. And my second bullet point is give yourself options. So a lot of times we think options is let me go put out a bidding war and, 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 and your bankers will be like, no, 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 I'm going to take your deck and I'm going to take it to like all these people and I'm going to try to get a bunch of bidders and we're going to pit them against each other. Remember, my philosophy is you've got to let the acquirer have the chance to make money too. All things considered. Obviously, I care about me and my shareholders first and foremost, sure. but, you know, and so on and so forth. It's not about every last dollar for me. I want the right home. If I am associated with something that is a success post me, so Dreamwater continues to grow and becomes a Coca-Cola one day or a 5 Hour Energy one day, I can tie my personal reputation and my personal brand to that just sure. because I was involved. Forget that I was a founder. If you were a sales guy for Dreamwater, if you were a finance person for Dreamwater, that matters too, especially because I was the elder statesman. Again, I was 38 when we sold. So I was the elder statesman. You're trying to build a career here also. Okay. So let's focus though on, so Steve says, hey, I need more time. What's your reaction? My, when I say give yourself options, that was in part, my immediate reaction, and it has to be true and authentic and real, no matter how much I wanted to, it to close and, and the transaction to happen, I immediately said, Steve, don't worry about it, man. In the inside, I'm like, fuck, fuck, fuck. I knew it was coming. But I was like, fuck, fuck, fuck. But um, I just said, Steve, but we talked about this. We contemplated this. Let's just shift, actually execute the, you know, take the LOI, which was way more detailed on the, on the licensing thing. Let's just go execute that. But here's the thing. Steve was already pot committed, not just financially, but he was pot committed in his mind to becoming the CEO of Dreamwater, to taking over Dreamwater. Mm-hmm. So I knew his, again, we, we talk all the time. I, I, you have to stay attuned to what's really the driver there. So you knew he, he won. He, was, he really wanted it and, and, and he validated it right there. So no, what he I don't want to do the licensing deal. The, no, I want to get the deal done. I say, Steve, how much more time do you need to get your deal done? A month. Really a month, Steve? No, maybe two months. Maybe two months to get the deal done, not to raise money, to get the deal done. And uh, he says two months. There was credibility behind it as to why. And then I just go to him and I say, okay, Steve, I'll give you your two months, but I want $100,000 today. None of it offset against the purchase price. I want $100,000 today on February 15th or whenever we execute the extension. And if on March 15th, you still need another month, I want another $100,000 then. Free and clear. It's not going to an escrow account. It's not going to nothing. It's coming into my bank account. So I'm going to use it to operate and to do all the things I want. Again, alternative financing methods that are incredibly different. 
in the meeting. So to be clear, it was it would have been implied. It would a it would have been applied against the sale price. Would had, not. There was no was offset not. against the sale price. I see. Okay, it was, it was just, in addition to, just wow. because. He could have said no Getting to him to pay for <laughs> your deal. Your deal. That's great. So, but what was I doing? So when you fish, depends on what the fish are. But when you fish conceptually, I'm not a fisherman. Um, you throw out your rod and then you got to reel it in. You don't just jerk it. And you don't, maybe you jerk it to hook it, but then you got to fight it and you don't want to fight too hard because then the line will break and whatever fishing analogies you want to make, but you got to reel it in. That's all I was doing here. So he, the hook's in his mouth. At this the hook point. was he in. Wants the, he wants the deal. Yeah. The hook is in. Every time that he paid me another hundred thousand, he was more committed to having it come sure. through. So I'm, what I'm doing, and I didn't necessarily even realize that that's what I was doing in that moment. I was just reeling him in a little bit more, reeling him in a little bit more to the point where he's going to do everything possible. Not me. I was living my life, going about my day sure, and all of that stuff. Um, he, um, you know, he was the one that was on the hook for all this stuff. Um, my third bullet point, my third key takeaway was don't be afraid to go all in. It's that moment of authenticity where I said to him, at least in a way that he heard me being authentic, that I'm okay with the transaction not happening, right? Let's just shift to the licensing deal. That's my, that was my all in moment in this deal, right? Because every 10 times out of 10, my immediate reaction would have been, fuck, Steve, fuck, what happened? You know, and I would have asked him all that. None of that happened. I just said, man, we've talked about it. We've thought about it. Go, you need more time. Great. And then we did that. And then we executed the extension. Um, we get to, we get to really the deal flow, the activity and the work picked up in March, in mid-March, really. So that's when it starts to pick up. So I have Deloitte in my office. I had a preset reason so that none of my employees would know why I was telling them that um, I'm going to go for another round of fundraising now that we're on the upswing again. Remember my business cycle, I had come down mm -hmm. I was on the upswing. So I'm going to raise more money. Um, that's why you're going to see Deloitte. That's why I'm asking for certain reports. So I built in an excuse so that nobody would even remotely know that I'm trying to sell this business, except for my right-hand man, who's really a woman, who's a controller. She was my finance person. So between us, we knew. I was shocked at the end that, that she never disclose that this was happening because sometimes she talks, right? And I knew her. I knew what I had to tell her to say and, and stress the importance of real confidentiality. And we're on lockdown. Um, All right. So March 15th, the, deal, the it rolls around. Documents are flying around. Yeah. Work is picking up. The, the deal flow is picking up. The contracts are multiple iterations sure. in and so on and so forth. And April 15th is rolling around and they need to the end of the month to finish. And so I'm sitting there saying, all right, I'll give you 15 days. 400 grand is enough to get you another 15 days. Um, and so, and so um, I give him another 15 days. As we're coming he agrees to, to give you it. Oh, okay. This is the same 400 grand we, we referred right, to I didn't earlier. charge yeah. them in that moment. Yeah. But I, we're coming to the end of it. The deal, just to foreshadow this, the deal was announced in, on May 3rd. It's a publicly traded cannabis company on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Um, and they need to announce before closing for stock exchange rules that they have up there. Part of it is also to validate they, that there's no, um, you can't have cannabis assets in non-federally legal territories if you're gonna trade on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Okay, but you lost me there because I thought it was guy Steve was the distributor for Dreamwater. Oh. How did you get to a cannabis company? That, because, that, that part because is- ultimately, Because ultimately what, thank you, thank you for bringing me back. Um, what he was really trying to do was him find a strategic that would buy the Canadian distribution arm and me in one fell swoop. Um, that turned out to be this company called Harvest One up in Canada. It was a, a cannabis company that was building all, they had raised a tremendous amount of money. Post, post transaction with me, they were sitting with over 60 million Canadian dollars in the bank. Post transaction with zero debt. So Steve was the one who brokered this deal and got Harvest One to buy Steve and you. In, yes. In effect. Yes. Got it. So that Got happened it. in that post February 15th process where the ultimate acquirer became self-evident, right? Like we actually when, understood what the plan was. When did you become aware that Steve wasn't raising the money for his own benefit? He was planning to essentially flip it to Harvest One. In March when they had, when they had their, and even then they weren't acknowledging exactly who the buyer was, but since I'm super resourceful and I'm really, really smart, I let them play their game. I don't want to get distracted with that, but 
they didn't even want to necessarily tell me right away who the acquirer was. They told me enough about the acquirer and I was able to figure out who the acquirer was. Uh, they never acknowledged it. Uh, but at different points, the acquirer, the acquirer staff wanted to go see our production facilities. We would produce between Dallas and Phoenix, even though we're based here. So they wanted to go see that. So I, at some point they had to tell me it was in that, that moment of diligence or whatever they were just sort of revalidating and wanted to see with their own eyes, including come down and meet me in my office here in Miami and things like that. So you can't keep that a secret for a long time, but it became self-evident when it really started to pick up, um, you know, you know what, what it looked like uh, and who was the acquirer. And, and so all of that is to say, though, that we come to the, to the end of this, and now they're telling me that we need another month. And that, to me, was the scariest part, because if we announce that we're getting bought by a cannabis company, but I sell to Walmart and Walgreens and CVS, I don't know how they're going to react. And for all I know, they're just going to send me an email and say, take your shit out of our stores. And if you don't close with me, I'm on the hook for that, not you. Right. So now we're going to be, because I wanted to keep it quiet. I didn't want to tell my employees. I didn't want to tell anybody. Mm -hmm. I wanted it to be done and then communicate. So that was a wrinkle. And it was funny because at that point they needed another month and there's more risk. So what did I do on May 1st or as May 1st was approaching? You want me to tell you more money. <laughs> it's another hundred thousand um, dollars. And my own lawyers look at me like, are you fucking kidding me, David? They are into this for hundreds of thousands of dollars because they had two massive Canadian law firms, a big U.S. law firm. They had Deloitte doing the diligence. Like, I can't even imagine what they spent on this transaction. I said, yeah, I don't care. It's another $100,000. And we are done here. We're basically done. Again, this go all in, you know, stick to your guns. But it was within reason. I had rationale. It wasn't like I was being a dick. I was just, it was, it was very self-evident, like everything that was going on and why I was going to ask for that money. But here's the other thing that I said to them. If you ever had a chance to clean up these couple balance sheet items, I didn't have traditional debt, but I had a, a couple balance sheet items that I said, if you ever want to clean that up, if you ever want to do, you should let me clean it up today. Because the minute that we announce that a company with 60 million Canadian dollars in the bank is buying us, you're getting zero discount on these line items. So they gave me even more money to clean that up all to the tune of about 750 grand. So when you say balance sheet items, you're referring to the company owed you some money personally? The company didn't owe me money personally. That wasn't what I was referring to. We, oh, okay. we, had, a, we had a couple of legal bills that were okay. outsized for some other stuff and they were just sitting on my balance sheet. So I said, effectively, if you want me to go and get this amount reduced, which I did by half, if you want me to do that, you have to let me do that now. And you have to give me the money now to do that. But you're gonna, close, you're gonna close the transaction anyway, right? There's no problems, there's no issues. I'm doing this for you, not for me. I'm thinking about you because the minute that you close with me and you announce, why would anybody give you any discount when you have that much money in the bank? Right. So you're constantly pressured testing this deal along the way and, and getting the hook question. deeper and deeper in. Right. And so that if the deal didn't happen and none of this was offset against the purchase price, this is all in addition to the purchase price, that if the deal didn't happen, well, shit, that was the most profitable $750,000, let's say, I had ever made because my cost of goods against that was zero. It was, and, and I, who's I paying, money. And, and David, who's paying that? Is that Steve, the distributor is paying that out, out of his bank account or it is it Harvest One? Okay. At one point it was Harvest, at the end it was Harvest One. Got it. And so, and so, um, so it's different people in different points. And, um, and that's great, right? So that's what that all looked like. That's what that all sounded like. What was the reaction to from uh, companies like Walmart and Walgreens when you told them you'd sold to a cannabis company? Very congratulatorily. Um, I didn't overtly tell them because I didn't want to put it on the radar if they didn't see the press release. I wasn't in a rush. But what I was really saying to them was not that I sold to a cannabis company, congratulate me. It was the, the positioning of it when I was in charge, when I was under control, um, was I now have that war chest of cash that I can go and do all the things that I've been wanting to do all this time that I didn't have the war chest with. There was a real transparency between me and my retail partners, a lot of which I had known over time. And I said, now I have this cash, this war chest of cash. Forget that it's cannabis for a second because they can't touch cannabis assets where it's not federally legal. So that was my hedge there on the cannabis side. That was the positioning that I now have this company with a tremendous amount of money backing me. So now you don't have to wonder what I'm going to do or how I'm going to spend or anything like that. That was basically the idea. Um, and, what, were the, 
what were the terms around staying on? What you said it was 34.5 million. Was that cash at closing or did you have to agree to stay on for a period of time? What was that like? I had no contingencies, no escrowing, no nothing uh, like that. Again, if I had done this the traditional, the right way with professionals, whatever, none of this, this story would have been re- real easy, real quick. I'm sure you've heard enough of them, you know, like this, because mm-hmm. none of this mm-hmm. stuff is normal. None of this stuff is, is, is the way you do things correctly. Um, and, and so um, uh, it wasn't about, uh, it wasn't about the, the, um, uh, the dollars and cents regarding me personally, I negotiated this to be as clean as much of a, as a purchase in as is condition. You know, when you buy a house as is, mm-hmm. they bought the company, not, it wasn't an asset sale. They bought the company because I was so clean and so tight with my documentation and so good in my diligence side, they bought me as is from a corporate perspective, which is also really insane because of all the potential liabilities that exist known or unknown in those types of scenarios. And I was very, very clear with them the entire way. I will not negotiate you hard on my agreement in, 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 in leveraging the things, my total comp package being four or 500 grand in year one is in no way going to jeopardize this sale going on. That was my approach. So I was very clear and transparent. Of course, what they did, and they were asking me for a long time, signed for two years. And my whole approach was, let me sign for one. By the way, in the original term sheet, my employment was spelled out in that, in that original. It wasn't a one. They, they were asking you to stay on for a year. But, the, but my employment, at least the, the, the broad parts of it, salary, benefits, whatever, was, was delineated in that original term sheet post Thanksgiving. So there was that level of detail. They didn't give me a contract or even talk. They were asking me to sign for two years. And my perspective was, let me sign for one and let me earn the second. Right. I wanted to, I wanted to make sure that the fit was right, that we, we, we got along, that it all worked. And I, just me, I said, let me earn the second, but I'm just trying to quantify that. I was very clear about the fact that my four or $500,000 a year comp package was not going to jeopardize the deal. So if they really wanted to hammer me and F with me or whatever, they handed me my, the draft of my employment agreement, say May 1st, again, this deal was announced on May 3rd, or maybe they handed it to me on April 30th, somewhere on there. It was at the very end tact as a tactful move on their part because they didn't want to continue to negotiate now this and, and drag that thing out. They knew that the deal's ready to go. Let's go. They didn't want to give me a lot of time to negotiate. They didn't really believe that I wasn't going to kill them because this purchase agreement is the, the cleanest sell side agreement probably ever in the history of selling a business as is here in the United States. And I had no, I had very limited indemnity. I had very, there was no escrow. There was no way that they can claw back this stuff. And whatever little bit of, of indemnities that I was offering, it was in that period of May 3rd announcing to the closing, which they had to do by the end of May. They had to, they ended up closing on May 30th. In other words, wiring me the money um, and finishing the transaction. And so, and so my personal part of it, I was clear and I didn't push them on it too much. I w- my employment agreement technically started June 1. And for a variety of reasons, I really wanted to stay in and see a bunch of the stuff that I was doing through. And I wanted to um, test my thought process. I had all these ideas in a digital ecosystem and direct to consumer and building a subscription recurring revenue model on my site. I wanted to do all that to see if it's true, if what I understood academically was going to happen in real life. That was my motivation. That would have been why I would have stayed. I didn't care about the title or whatever. I wanted to see it through, but it became very quickly evident that they were like, no, 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 slow and steady. Uh, don't worry about it. No, no, no. We're not, do- we're not doing anything right now. I said, that's not me. You can relegate me or give me my, you- here's your options with me. I'm not an employee. I know I'm your employee now, but I'm not an employee. So for me, either relegate me, you know, for- you put me off to the side and get rid of me or give me my lanes and let me go. Um, and that's what I meant by I'm not an employee. Give me my lanes and let me go. Um, I lasted about three weeks. Um, <laughs> they paid me. Dude. They paid me not very, very amicable. None of this was weird or, or difficult. Yeah. Um, I lasted about three weeks and they paid me out the entirety of that one year. I sh- now in retrospect, I was like, man, I should have done the I two, year. have for two years. I would have <laughs> made double as much. Um, but, uh, but they paid me out the contract in full. 
And, um, you know, and to this day, I'm there to help and serve. And, and I care about it because it's my baby, right? Um, yeah. You know, so there's that. I love it. Did you buy yourself a trophy? What, what did you go buy as a, as a reward for this journey? So the things that if I was doing this as a Dreamwater centric dissertation versus a, an interview where you see, even you were so hooked by the story that you were so focused on the other details that you told me this was going to be a, a, an interview about my exit. And you spent, you know, 30 to 40 minutes at the beginning asking me about dream water. That was what my life is like. Always. I go to dinner my entire life since I did dream water. Tell me about dream water. It was always a point sure. of conversation, even in social circles, um, you know, and so on and so forth, for whatever that's worth. Um, I, I went through a divorce toward the start of, I had two little kids. My daughter wasn't even two. My son was 10 months old when I left the house. To me, that's when I got the divorce. Um, I went through a divorce. Um, I, I, uh, I also... Uh, saw the, the, the benefits of, of being lean and mean in terms of certainly your fixed overhead, such that when you lose a huge customer, a substantial amount of your huge customer base, that you can live for another day. I didn't live my life in debt personally or professionally. I didn't, I'm not saying that that's good too. I think some amount of debt is good and it's beneficial and helpful, but I did, I lived my life this way. And so coming into this, I should also say as a backdrop, I come from a very entrepreneurial family and a very successful family. And so let me, let me be absolutely transparent and clear. I, I still got a tremendous amount of support financial and otherwise from my parents in my thirties. Um, I didn't abuse that support. In other words, I wasn't getting that support and buying myself a Ferrari. I drove a very normal car. Um, I still drive a very normal car, but I guess enough things happen in life. You know, my generation coming into the, uh, I graduated from university of Michigan business school in 2002 into one of the worst recessions in that moment. Everything was like rocking and rolling, rocking and rolling. Most of my classmates in the best business school in the country did not have a job. So I already had that as a mark in my early 20s, let's say, right? Then fast forward into my late 20s, we have the greatest of depressions in 08, 09 with the financial crisis. Sure. And this is two years before COVID, but I've had two marks, even on a subconscious level that say, life doesn't always work out the way you need it to work out. Um, don't cash matters really more than cash cash flow matters. And so my trophies were not, I needed a car. I've lived a very good life. Thank God. And I, I will always credit my parents for that. Um, I used to, in my twenties, want to be a self-made man in spite of my parents. And in my thirties, mm -hmm. as I matured and evolved, I, I, I grew to very implicitly openly and internally to me say, thank you for being my parents. Thank you for giving me this opportunity or these opportunities to go to school, to not graduate with debt, you know, all these things over time. I am incredibly lucky and I'm incredibly, but you know, I'm incredibly lucky in that regard. But I, I never wanted to be that, that guy that just, you know, is always taking and taking and taking. I didn't want them to be like, well, why am I helping you, you know, be above and beyond if, if in other words, so they did it because they saw who I was as a person. And who I was as a person does not require, I'm not a car guy. I didn't need a boat, even though I'm in South Florida. I didn't need a Ferrari and I didn't need any of that. But what I did understand implicitly, what I did want was cash flow. I didn't want to put money in the bank. I also never made money in the stock market. So I wasn't trying to put it into the stock market. But all of a sudden, I started to invest in some real estate deals. I started to invest into some lending funds. I started to do things that weren't going to be necessary. I did some home run swinging type of stuff into some businesses or otherwise. But I knew that I wanted to build a cash flow basis. And then I wanted to live my life off of the cash flow, not off of the cash. But if I go buy a $300,000 sports car and I go buy a $2 million house and I go buy a $500,000 boat, well, shit, that just went, you know, what did I just say? Three, four million post-tax dollars. Post-tax dollars, okay? Yeah. And so uh, that's not me. I didn't want to do that. Um, and mind you, I don't live my life in debt. So I just was was shooting for cash flow, um, And that was the real truth. I mean, that, you know, I didn't, I didn't have to have a trophy, but because of that reason. Um, and Perfect. to some degree, and to some degree, I think it's a bigger fuck you status symbol, if you really want to look at it that way, that I just sold my company for all this money. And I drive a, the same car that every mom in my, my kid's school drives. <laughs> but I do that because, just to hammer home that point, I do that because I have little kids, I have little nieces and nephews and their friends. And if I have a nice car, I'm going to be worried about the car in my car that I have jump to the back seat, 
come in with sand from the beach. Bring your Cheerios. But you eat your food. I just don't care. Does that make any sense? That was really, totally. if I had a nice car, I would have cared. Um, so that was really the, the thought process behind, you know, my exit. Awesome. Awesome. Well, it's an incredible story. I, I'm, I'm very grateful for you sharing it. I, I think a lot of people will, will find it amazing. Uh, where can people, if they want to reach out to you and, and, and say hi and, uh, in, uh, on social or what, what's the best way to reach out? Sure. I'm on LinkedIn, David Lekach, L-E-K-A-C-H. I'm on Instagram, david.lekach. Um, my email is david lekach at gmail.com. Do not be shy to reach out. Um, I believe in paying it forward. Uh, in EO, we have to make a mark. Again, when I, we finish this interview, I'm going back to war rooming. How do you bring an entire community back into, into, uh, uh, into, into school? Um, but, but before we break and before we wrap up by way of like sort of a, a, a thing that is necessary to acknowledge is that if I think about my exit sort of in terms of a bigger thought process is <clears throat> if it's about the money, you're going to burn out because nothing, there's nothing that says that I'm going to start this. I'm going to do enough right things. I'm going to sell it in year five. Again, I'm an, I'm a nine. I was in my ninth year. I'm a nine year overnight success, nine years. It's almost a decade. It's almost a decade. And, and, um, and so I just wanted to acknowledge that and, and my co-founders, my, my, my original crew, including my younger brother, they all burnt out at one point or another. They just did. I don't know where, how I found that resolve to keep going, but it was really fundamentally because we would get so much consumer feedback directly, not esoterically about the impact that we were making on their lives. That's what kept me going substantially time and time and time again, because I wasn't paying myself much money. Operationally, Dreamwater was a dog for me. I, on a day-to-day -day basis, I was not, the first five years, I took zero salary. The first, let me repeat that. The first five years, I took zero comp, zero. And, and, uh, and I went through a divorce in those first five years. So whatever little that I had in my name, my ex took more than half of it. Okay. Um, and so I want to be clear that for me, the, the real motivator, when I can look back and diagnose, it was that. It was the impact. It was the, to me, I found it really cool that this idea that I had equaled tens of millions of bottles sold over time right under my stewardship of, over this little idea that I had, you know, way back when, and, and, and then seeing the impact. And what I will tell you, you said, what toy did I get? A lot of people do that or, you know, trophy. Yeah. You know, whatever, whatever trophy that you have, the most rewarding part of the entire experience, because this was really like a family for all of us. We grew up together. Again, I was the elder statesman when I sold this at 38 years old. We all grew up together. Um, and I will tell you that the best part was, since I wasn't doing much in the time from May 3rd when they announced the deal to May 30th when they closed on purpose, and that's not for the purpose of this call right now, but, uh, or this webinar, I wrote letters of appreciation and, and gratitude to my staff. And there was a pool of money that I didn't mention, but there was a pool of money in this structure that wasn't for my shareholders. It was, it was literally set up to be a, a pool that was at my discretion that I could say thank you to whoever or I could pocket the whole thing myself if I wanted to. But that's how we set this thing up, this transaction on that side. And they did try to negotiate that pool of money away from me multiple times. My hmm. answer was always absolutely no. Because what I did was even the cleaning lady in my office here, we're not all based in Miami. Um, we had real base of operations in Dallas. And again, we produced with a co-packer in Phoenix as well, but um, we were not all in Miami. Um, but even the cleaning lady in my office in Miami got a thousand bucks just as a thank you, which <laughs> you can imagine is a lot of money. But what I really tried to do, especially on a longevity basis, it wasn't merit based. It was just, you know, how you felt or whatever. I tried to get to one pe one year salary for the people that I wanted to say thank you to, or that I just had some extra funds to say, thank you. You didn't have to be a W2 employee. You could have been just somebody to help me along the way. It was <laughs> my way to say thanks, that little pool of money. Um, but it wasn't the money. It was that I wrote these letters to tell them it would do half a page, half a page, max a full page. If it was really in depth, not more than that. And the emotional connection and the, um, that thing was the most awesome part of this. Hmm. Better than giving my shareholders their money back or a return on their money, better than putting the money in my pocket or whatever. For me, it was another day. My mom calls me. I was out at a conference. My mom calls me and says, have you seen on May 30th? Have you seen your bank account? And I said, no. She goes, look at it. I looked at it. I said, wow, that's cool. And I went about my day. Right. My life didn't change. How come your mom's seen your bank account, man? 
Oh, we have family <laughs> office. We have a family Change office. Change your so passwords. She's no, she's the one that sees everybody, everybody <laughs> professional and, and whatever, because she's the repository for that. Yeah. But but my point is is that I just I would be remiss if I didn't say that that was the best part. That and to some degree, the second best part, even before I say myself or the shareholders, was my EO group, my entrepreneur group, because they lived my life with me, not just my dream mm. water life. They lived this whole journey with me. And so that first monthly meeting that we had after after the, the, the sale, um, it was very awesome and emotional for me and for oh, all of us because we lived it and did it together, right? So I would be remiss if I didn't say that. Appreciation and gratitude matter. They matter for me most of all, but also on the receiving side. That's incredible. Well, good for you for paying it forward and, uh, and for sharing for, with us. I really appreciate you doing that. Uh, so listen, uh, thank you again. And uh, we've got your, we'll put your uh, coordinates in the, in the show notes as well. Uh, thank you for doing this. Thank you guys. Thank you for having me and thank you for listening.